So thank you all very much for having me here tonight. Um, I want to thank Dr. Velasquez Torres, President Travis. Where did President Travis go? He left before I spoke. <laughs> um, but I want to thank all of you for having me here tonight. Um, maybe he's somewhere else. Uh, it's really my honor always um, to to continue to honor my grandfather and everything that he did in his life, but particularly this, because Seek was very dear to his heart, Percy E. Sutton Seek, I should say, since it's been renamed after him. This was, amongst all his accomplishments, one of the, the a handful of, this was one of, say, two or three things for which he was most proud. And when, for those of you who don't know who he was and what he did, um, he accomplished a lot in his life, so this, this says a lot. And I'll tell you a little bit about who Percy Sutton was. Excuse me, I'm, if I'm wheezing, I'm having asthma trouble these days. I apologize. So Percy Sutton was from San Antonio, Texas originally. He was the youngest of 15 kids, um, born in 1920. Uh, so for the moms in the room, that's right. My great-grandmother was having children or nursing for 23 years. She gets a real round of applause. Yes, for my great granny. Yes, she's, that's, a, that's a strong woman. And by the way, when she died, she was healthy. She died in a fire. Uh, she died at 101, I believe, in a fire. Um, so she was a healthy and very strong woman. So the youngest of 15 kids in a family where, where education was paramount. My, uh, my great-grandmother was uh, the teacher in, their, in the local high school, and my great-grandfather was the principal. Was the principal. Some of my grandfather's older siblings were actually his teachers. Because again, you know, he had 30-year-old siblings when he, when he, when he went to, you know, to grade school. Um, education, again, was paramount. My great-grandfather had actually been born into slavery. And he, both of them, saw at their education as the key to success, the key to freedom. And freedom didn't just mean, you know, physical freedom, lack of slavery. Freedom meant the ability to, to control and impact one's own destiny. That was what they were aspiring, aspiring for and working toward um, both my great-grandparents. So all 15 children were, um, the, the focus for the 15 children was their education. Of the 15 kids, 12 of them lived to adulthood. All 12 had college degrees. Of the 12, seven studied toward had work had done work toward graduate studies. Four of them had graduate degrees. My grandfather was a lawyer. His brother was a lawyer and became a New York State Supreme Court judge. My uh, his sister was a doctor. Another one became a professor. Another one went on to work with George Washington Carver on the uses of the peanut in Russia. He moved to Russia. I have a, there's a, a, a whole section of my family called the Satanoviches. No joke, no joke, for real. We have Juan Satanovich, which he's named after John Sutton. <laughs> That's the Russian version of Juan Sutton, uh, of John Sutton. Um, so they all, they were all, they, I frankly, you know, when I think about that, I think it's absolutely extraordinary that a black family in the deep south was able to achieve that level of education with that many children. And when I look around and I, I think about us here today and I think about the obstacles that our families had to face, uh, that my family had to face back then, I say, we can do better. You know, we as, as a people need to be, if we value this, we can do better. So, um, so all the kids became educated. Then my grandfather went on uh, to become a Tuskegee Airman. Can I get a show of hands? Is there anyone in the room who knows who the, what the Tuskegee Airmen were? All right. I want to see more of the young people with their hands up. <laughs> but I'm glad to see a good number of folks in the, in the audience that, that know who the Tuskegee Airmen were. Tuskegee Airmen, for those of you who don't know, were the first African Americans in the country who were permitted to fly fighter jets. The thought was that, um, that the, a fighter jet was too complicated a piece of machinery for the intellect of an African American, that we could not handle that. And it turns out, of course, that because um, we could, and because they put us through the rigors physically, emotionally, spiritually, we ended up being, the Tuskegee Airmen ended up being the best and the brightest, literally. They had amongst the best record in the military in terms of lost or not lost um, planes, and in terms of protecting the, the flight, the planes that they were actually protecting. So, um, so the Tuskegee Airmen were extraordinary, and on all, many of them went on to, to do lots of other f amazing things. So my grandfather, when he came back, he made use of the GI Bill and went to law school. While he was in law school at Brooklyn Law, he 
waited tables at Lundy. He, he worked three jobs. He waited tables at Lundy's in Brooklyn, for those of you who may remember Lundy's. Um, he worked as a postal service um, worker, and he drove the A train up and down the west side of Manhattan. So he held down three jobs while he was in law school. Became a lawyer, then became Malcolm X's lawyer at a time when Malcolm X was not um, the celebrated leader that he is today. He was a very bold and risky undertaking at that time. And he was frankly very bold. Uh, he, the story goes, he walked up to uh, Minister X and said, you know, you need a good lawyer. And he said, you wouldn't take me because he looks like, you know, a buttoned up, uh, you know, conservative looking guy. And he says, no, absolutely I will. And the next thing you know, he becomes Malcolm X's lawyer and very close confidant of, of him, Dr. Shabazz, his widow, as well as their daughters all the way through. Their family is, is, is like our family. Um, became Malcolm X's lawyer and then decided he wanted to get into politics. So he ran for state senate, which is where he, along with Arthur Eve, established SEEK. I'll come back to that. After that, went on to become Manhattan Borough President, uh, and then the first African-American to run for mayor of New York City. Mayor Dinkins always correct, uh, credits him, rather, as, as being the predecessor that enabled him to, to run successfully. Um, he, he says, if Percy Sutton hadn't run such a classy campaign, no one would have taken me seriously when I ran. Uh, that's a direct quote from that. I didn't say it. He said it. <laughs> um, so he ran for mayor which was big um, at the time, and then decided uh, that he, while he's been a Hattonboro president, decided, you know, we as African Americans need to, um, and, and as underrepresented people really, need to impact the media, need to control our own, our own images in media and be our own voice in the media. And that, you know, as such, of course, we ought to own our own radio stations so that we can program, program them to reflect the news that we, the way we want to, you know, to hear it, that we, we know to be authentic, to play our music and so forth. So he brought together an investor group to buy um, our first radio stations, WLIB and then WBLS. Um, and, you know, the investor group, of course, include, may, included Mayor Dinkins and Dr. Shabazz and other notables. But the thing that was notable, I think, most about them that I reflect on often is that these were um, his peer group was striving as he was. He surrounded himself with people who were focused, 100% focused, on us as a community controlling our own destiny and, um, and, and, and um, being able to impact our community um, and better our community. He lived his life to give to whatever community, whether it's Texans or Harlemites or African Americans or his fraternity or what have you, he gave constantly and but he also surrounded himself by people who were all you know were thinking all along the same lines all the way and working all along the same lines and who were also who were equally empowered to do such a thing um, and that's key feeling empowered and feeling bold all of these things I think were incredibly bold so and he did so I'll go back to seek he did all so oh I'm sorry I forgot one last thing after starting the radio company then he thought Oh, I love the Apollo Theater. I've always loved the Apollo Theater. I want to reopen this, and and um, it was in it was dark. It had been dark for um, nearly a decade. He bought it out of bankruptcy. Started a little television show called It Showed Time at the Apollo. Wrote the theme music for it. Came up with the concept, and it became a mega hit. Uh, you know, um, in the 90s, and uh, something for which he was very proud that the reopening the Apollo created jobs in Harlem and really spurred a lot of the redevelopment that you see in Harlem, uh, that along with the empowerment zones that Congressman Rangel um, passed. So that's him in a very quick nutshell, uh, 89 years um, in a nutshell. <laughs> um, but the lessons that I, as I said, the lessons that I take, you know, from him I, if I go back to the SEEK program, he did it again in, in conjunction with Arthur Eve. And they did it not just because they were in the midst of the civil rights movement and that they knew that education was, was the key to achieving that equality and freedom. But they did it um, as well, because you know, they also did it because they were focused on bringing others along as they moved forward. So they were, you know, in a position to affect change and they used it smartly, wisely, and very powerfully. At the time, that, but you'll see in the film, that um, at the time, they didn't have, it was the Black and Hispanic caucuses. Um, there, the Republican leadership of the um, state Senate did, was opposed to you know, the legislation and they were not supportive. And what they did is they sat down and they counted their votes. They said, okay, we have the power to block your future legislation if you don't get this piece of legislation passed. 
And that's how Percy E. Sutton Seek program came to be. They used, they focused, they drummed up their power, and they used their power to, to push forth that which they knew was imperative for their communities. So I, again, boldness, focused, empowered. I love the empowerment there. So here you go, you got on the, the Percy E. Sutton Seek program has, has come to exist. And frankly, when I look around the room and I see many of you who are in the program and are pushing yourselves forward, many of you are graduating, many of you are graduating with honors or are on honors programs now even though you're not graduating. And what I see in that is boldness. It takes the boldness to go find the SEEK program and apply and decide that your future and that your life is worthy of this education and that you can take this education and do more, a, a lot more with it. Um, so I applaud all of you on that same kind of boldness that I saw in him as well as all of his peers. As I, as I close, I want to just say, um, you know, the, the, well, first let me say before I close, I want to um, thank and applaud not just the students, but the faculty, the advisors, the mentors, the administrators, everyone that makes the financial aid folks, everyone that makes this program exist and run every single year. So first, let me thank you. I mean, can will you please give every, all of those folks a round of applause. And each of those people embodies that mission and, that is behind SEEK. Uh, I, the passion that I see as I have the, have the honor and pleasure of coming to speak with, you know, with groups like this is just, it's, um, it's infectious. Uh, the, you know, these folks that I just mentioned are so vested in the success of each one of these students, it just makes my heart go pitter-patter. And I know that my grandfather is smiling broadly and that his heart would be going pitter-patter at the sight of all of you here today. And he will be even more you know, delighted and over the moon to know that each one of you is gonna be graduating. Um, if you're not tonight, then somewhere down the line. That you're graduating and that you, are all, you will all go move forward and reach back. So you reach back to your SEEK program classmates, you go back to your high school and tell other kids about SEEK. You, you know, you reach back, oh, very important thing, please keep your networks tight. Um, one of the things that I've learned through my career is to focus on the, pe not just, you know, the, my mentors, but my peers, because my peers grow and they become partners in law firms and they become bankers here and they become, you know, leaders in education and they do all kinds of amazing things that, you know, that enable us to help one another. Um, so stay in touch with your peers, continue to be bold and empowered and reach back at every step along the way in every way that you can. Give of your time, your energy, your money as you get it. And no, really, <laughs> my grandfather gave, 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 gave. Time, energy, introductions. He was constantly introducing this person to that person. And by doing so, he made everybody successful. And everyone, this is the little secret, everyone felt indebted to him because he had done that for, you know, he had done these things for him. Um, oh, for them rather, so that's the little secret behind the success because they would always, you know, help him because they had, he had helped them. Um, but he really just did it because he believed in moving everyone forward together. So congratulations to you, all, for, to you all for being a part of the program and to those of you who are graduating for, for, for moving on to the next step. And uh, I'm gonna, that's it, I'm gonna wrap it up and let you guys move on. <laughs> Thank you.